This is your Chargers linebacker, Dan Henley, and you're tuning in with Chargers Unleashed. Welcome to a special edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner, Dan Wolkenstein, and joining us all the way from the Locked On Chargers podcast network, Dave Drugmeyer and Daniel Wade. Gentlemen, it's been a minute since the four of us have been in the four box for all of us to talk. <laughs> now, draft is over with. All eyes are on the beginning of the season. I know we all wish that it was tomorrow, but first off, how the hell are you? And I'm so excited to talk some Chargers football with you guys. I'm so excited. I mean... I'm partially always glad when the draft is over and then I say, hey, you know what, next season I'm just going to watch these guys when they actually play during the season and then, you know, the 100 hours of film or whatever. I'm like, no, I'm never actually watching college football again. So <laughs> now we know what the team looks like. I'm super glad to be here with you guys. It's been obviously way too long. It has been too long and it's always great to see you guys. Uh, always admire your hustle. I know obviously covering the Chargers, it takes a lot of work and it's always a very interesting uh, situation. But yes, thank God the draft is over. Now we know exactly who the Chargers took and we know uh, what what the plan is and how they are going to work out this season. So, well, and David, we always get to come on after like Dayon Henley, right? So it's like, oh my God, <laughs> we, we must be pretty fancy people if we I get mean, to come hey, on man. and follow that guest list. They're rolling out the red carpet for us. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm curious to ask, because you guys have brought it up, you know, finally the draft's over and Wait, as you were talking about, just like, okay, good. I don't have to watch college football more for that one. At what point do you like say to yourself, like, okay, I'm at the breaking point with watching film on guys. Like, just just take me to the draft and just let it be done. I don't want right. to watch anymore. <laughs> uh, usually about two weeks out of the draft, I'm ready to pretty much claw my eyeballs out. I mean, <laughs> it, it's so crazy because it's like you watch all these people and like, you have no idea whether they're going to end up on the Chargers or not, you know, but you just want to have like a good feel for it. And me and David, you know, are not draft experts, but like, no. God, the Chargers podcast out here just hold everything to such a high level. I mean, you guys and every, you know, all the other guys out there, like you feel like you need to be a draft expert that time of year, you know? So like, first of all, it's like you have to go through the black market to even get college football film. Yeah. Like the things in the, you know, children, future children I've had to give away, just to do these draft breakdowns like you would not believe. So like it always ends up cracking me eventually, you know, the last few weeks for sure, as you're just trying to, you know, cover as much as you can. You're doing seven round mock drafts and watching dudes who are going to be, you know, undrafted free agents. So yeah. it, it gets crazy for sure, but always a lot of fun, especially when you watch some of the guys they end up taking. I think it just for us, because we go five days a week and because yeah. of the amount of guys that we have to watch, it it just it ends up being five, six hours of film on several nights. And that's just how it has to be. And so, yeah, a couple of weeks before the draft, it's like, man, all right, I, I need a day off. Like, I cannot yeah. watch any more draft prospects or else I am going to have to go cry in a corner. Like, When I had to give you the rest of the lot. week off the undrafted free agents, David. I mean, we were talking about undrafted free agents. <laughs> yeah, so of course, like, it no, was just me he had to give no, a day Oh, off no, for, yeah. for sure. Himself. For no, sure. No, we both, we both needed it for sure. But, like, yeah. I was like, we were talking. I'm like, you know what? We'll talk about undrafted free agents next week. Like I, we are not turning on any more college film or anything Thank this God. week. We'll have to wait. You know, the fans will have to wait for those guys. Well, that's fair. That's fair. But today we get to talk about the drafted guys, the ones yes. that were actually picked by the Los Angeles Chargers. And for those who have not joined us on a joined us on a live show before, welcome to Chargers Unleashed Live Thursday edition crossover with the guys over at Locked On Chargers. A ton of stuff to get into today. Obviously, we're going to get into this draft class the Chargers got. Maybe who our favorites are and most important selections of this draft class. As well as talk about some second-year guys that might need to step up. Yeah. As well as the hype level of this year compared to last and following that, the last topic. Biggest concerns. We can't be out of here with all roses. Got to go into some of the negativity. Bring Jake up a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> that's my topic, baby. Jake, before we get into it, over or under, how many Marvel references on this episode? I'm going to go one and a half. Well, I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy officially drops tonight. I don't know There's anybody one. else that's seeing it. Um, I am seeing it on Saturday. So I assume everyone who's not here watching this currently is watching Guardians of the Galaxy. That makes a lot of sense. But Dan, what was the line? One and a half. Well, we already blew well, over it. Yeah, give me another line. Give me another line. <laughs> May the fourth be with you, gentlemen. Yeah. No, <laughs> by the way. Yes. yes. Whatever it is, screw it. It's going over. 
Um, I want to just remind everybody real quick before we get started that Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. Always the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports and events, whether that's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. So head on over to betonline.ag to join. Receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. All you got to do is use that promo code BELIEVE. That's B-L-E-A-V to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. So live edition, we know how this goes. Folks in the comments watching live, uh, go ahead and give us comments, questions, things you'd like us to discuss. We'll go ahead and do our best to kind of integrate as long as we can. When you guys stop talking to us, we'll stop talking to you. Uh, First topic on the board, gentlemen, lots of folks drafted. Lots of people talked about. Chargers went seven deep, got seven guys. First topic, favorite draft selection. Not the best one, but your favorite one. I'll start with you, Mr. Wade. Favorite draft selection. It's tough, man. I mean, it it felt like a draft to me where, like, there wasn't a single pick I fell in love with right away, but I ended up as a whole really liking what they put together and really liking pretty much all of their picks, you know, just based on what the role is going to be, less so than the value or perceived value going in. It's hard for me not to say Dayon Henley, man, for a few different reasons. I know you guys had him. I don't have to tell you, you know, just how electric, no pun intended, that dude is. I mean, I said, I think on last night's show, I called him the defensive Josh Kelly, right? Like, that's what it seems like. Dude who's just, you know, walking in, beaming, fills up room with his, you know, attitude. And just like the dude said, bolt up, I think, 115 (laughs) times in his introductory meeting, right? Where with introductory video to the Chargers, like that dude couldn't be any more happy to stay home in LA, right? And I think, you know, for logical reasons, for practical reasons, like someone to push Kenneth Murray, right? Kenneth Murray going into the last year of his contract, Eric Hendricks in a two-year contract. So like the Chargers not waiting until it's an emergency need to try to address it, right? You have someone to potentially get in on sub package and things this year. I think his ability, you know, and his elusiveness to get around blocks is something, I mean, probably the tops in this class, but also just, having a future at that position, having someone that could potentially take over for Kenneth Murray next year and not waiting to where it's like, okay, we have to spend a first round pick on a linebacker because we've gotten ourselves in a situation where we have no one to kind of fill that room. Yeah, I think the last time when, when we uh, an, an addressed this question or answered this question on our own show, I, I kind of was fighting against my actual true feelings. <laughs> I think my favorite draft pick in this draft is one of my draft crushes is Darius Davis, the 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 kick returner, punt returner at a TCU. I, I think I said Thule, uh on another show, on one of our shows, which honestly, it's Darius Davis because he's electric, man. What, what he's going to bring to the special teams, uh, you know, we've had a, a guy that was good at kick returning, but bad at punt returning. We've had a guy that's good at punt returning and bad at kick returning. I'm hoping that Darius Davis is going to come in here and be electric at both, and I am Definitely meaning pun intended. I mean, this is a guy that averaged over 15 yards per punt return in college. in a bottle. Just unbelievably fast. I mean, you saw the video, I'm sure, on social media where he was running over 23 miles per hour. You can immediately see his impact on special teams and also as a gadget guy on the offense because if you present this guy with a runway, he's going to run away from every single person on the defense. He has that real speed. We've been clamoring for real, true (laughs) speed for the Chargers for many, many years, and they finally addressed it. So I'm happy that they have it and that they double dipped at wide receiver. I think that was important as well. So, so Henley's off the board. We've got Darius Davis off the board. Jake, I'll let you go next. But with Darius Davis, I guess the question for you, I'll let you transition with this. Is he the answer that the Chargers have asked for for speed? Because a lot of people have been claiming for speed for months, years at this point. They get Quentin Johnson and they get him. Is that the answer? Like, is that enough? Does that supply what folks have been looking for or yourself specifically? I mean, it's this, it gives you encouragement to know how Brandon Staley used DeAndre Carter last year. You know, he did not come in specifically as a returner. I think that there is actually some belief and some truthfulness behind it that he's going to insert um, Darius Davis into this roster as more of a receiver than just a special teams player. But you go out and you spend your fourth round pick. And like I said earlier this week, that some people may have considered that a reach. But when you take the one of the top kick returners in college last year. And for what he did and what you've been lacking on special teams over the last couple of years, you needed some juice in that. So you go out and you take the guy who ran the fastest 40 time for the receivers at the combine electric kick return production that he did there at TCU. I think it was a fantastic pick. Um, 
to tr is it is it is it exactly what we need? Obviously, time will tell. But I mean, on paper right now, and I hate to use that phrase, <laughs> that it is. looks it looks good as it stands right now. I so I think that they were Dan to take a word from you. Uh, responsible with those picks. I think they knew what they needed. Um, I think Kellen Moore has an idea of how he's going to in integrate everybody here into this offense. Transition to my favorite pick. It's really a toss-up because I know I've talked about Thule so much. And just as far as the fit goes, the versatility that he brings to this defense, how Brandon Staley is going to use him, I really like the possibilities for that. However... Scott Matlock is really growing on me. <laughs> Scott Matlock is rapidly growing on me, dude. I just love this guy's attitude. Are you a soul taker as well? No. I would love to be a soul taker, but I'm not I'm not I mean I'm not big and ugly and mean right. and nasty like him, dude. And I he those are his responsibilities. I will leave those to him. But I'm excited to see what he's gonna do, man. As a rotational piece, you come in, you wear 99, you look like Max Crosby's dolp doppelganger. Like, I'm ready to see some nastiness in the middle of this defensive line with him, along with uh, Sebastian Joseph Day, with Austin Johnson, with Morgan Fox. This could turn out to be a really nasty interior defensive line, and I love it. We have Mark Matlock in the comments. I have to ask, is Mark at all related to the other, I don't know, better or worse, Scott, Scott Matlock? Mark, let us know in the comments. Are you related, or just is this just a fun name that you guys have? <laughs> or is he just a, a Mar or is he just a Matlock Stan? Uh, there we go. What is it? Uh, hey, Stan accounts are welcome here. Uh, you guys took a bunch of them. Honestly, I think for me, since I'm not, I don't want to double up. Tuli Tuipolo Tu, I think, is one that is probably going to be undervalued at the beginning, but I think is going to be incredibly important for this coming season. We talked about it going into last season, Jake. You and I. And I had said I felt that the edge position was the weakest and most concerning for me in terms of depth. And as soon as one of those two guys, as much as we like Chris Brumpf, as much as like the rest of the guys, they're not those two. And the drop-off between those was glaring when you saw Joey Bosa out. Now having edge, it's amazing how we are able to look at these picks and pro you could argue all of them aren't starting. And that's the sign of a quality team. But I think for edge position specifically with how Brandon Staley's defense is run, that's, I think, what's going to be looked at and probably felt the most on defense. It might not be the sexy one that you see going crazy sideline to sideline, but being able to have a rotation and being able to give these guys some time to where they're not going to get hurt so often or have more opportunities to get hurt as often, I think it's going to be a big one. Let's get into some of these comments real quick. Uh, questions. Apparently, Guardians, everyone's wanting to see the Guardians movie. <laughs> uh, folks want to talk about week one stats. We'll see if we can get into that later on in a second. Thomas Costello asks, JJ, what are the odds or do we stand pat? I'll go with you, Wade. Do you think JJ happens? Oh, do I think it happens? Do I want it to happen? Yes. Uh, it's hard, man. I mean, I feel like everything they've put out there is, you know, how much they they like the group they have. But at the end of the day, it's three deep. Right. I mean, it's JT Woods, it's Derwin James, and it's Alohi Gilman. I mean, Raheem Lane, very, very small sample size. Who knows what he does in training camp, right? But it seems like one of the shallowest positions coming out of the draft that wasn't addressed. I would do it. It's so hard to say if they would do it. Lindsay Theory reported before the draft that they were interested, right? That there were some talks. So it shows me at least that they're open to it. I would say yes. I'm going to say yes. Okay. Uh, next question we've got from Prismatic Artistic Magic. This one will go to you, David. Who wins the back of quarterback job, Stick or Duggan? And should we let go of Chase Daniel? Yeah, I mean, I, I think going into this year, I think it's going to be Easton Stick that, that's going to be your guy. I think you look at the contract and, and you know, he, he's going to have a little bit more money there. I mean, not a whole lot, obviously, but I think that this is a situation where you have Easton Stick as your backup quarterback and you carry Max Duggan on the practice squad to eventually be that cheap successor for uh, Easton Stick and be your kind of backup quarterback of the future for Justin Herbert. They're not putting Duggan on the practice squad. Also, Chase Daniels is already gone, right? I mean, right, right. That, that, yeah, that's that's what they said. Okay, yeah. No, since they let go, I mean, yeah. I don't know if they would 
risk Mass Duggan on the practice squad just because, hey, then he's free game, right? You can protect people I'm just sometimes. I'm so tired of seeing three quarterbacks. I know what you want, David, man. but we've just, talked about this. We know what's going to happen. You know, as much as we like it or don't like it, it's what's going to happen. They're going to carry all three of them, but I think <sighs> the level playing field of a new offense, does that give Max Duggan a chance? Being able to play with his guys, does that give Max Duggan a chance for the Yeah, backup? it gives him a chance. Yeah, maybe we'll see. Weapon X asks, <laughs> Mr. Wade is related to Mr. Matlock, right? It's got to be the ginger beard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I'm not a redhead, though. I'm just a red face. So I don't know. I don't think that we're related. I mean, sometimes we have the same crazy look in our eyes, but uh, I also have never snatched a soul, you know, or, but who knows, you know, you go back far enough, you find some things. Gray Lange, I'm guessing that's how you pronounce it. I'm not sure what origin this is from. Where do you rank this draft class at first glance? Telesco has been here 10 years now. Great, great question. This is one of the topics, so we'll kind of skip ahead. We'll go to this one. Uh, Jake, you're a draft nut. We all are. This draft was a little different feeling than we've seen in years past. I've said responsible, targeted. Uh, where do you rank this draft class in recent years? Yeah, as a, as a whole, Dan, I, I told you, I was very impressed with this draft. I thought 95% of it outside of the last selection, I was very happy with. Uh, you know, we've had other ones where it's like, you know, you get the Rashawn Slater, Asante Samuel Jr. pairing, and then it's, you know, the dreaded third pick that we're all waiting for. Really, when you look at it, it's like, oh, my God, <laughs> they got value. They didn't reach in the third round yeah. this year. And then they continued to add valuable depth pieces after that. I mean, I'm... I'm I'm not going to lie, dude. I was extremely happy after this draft was done. And everybody making their snap judgments that they think this is the best or the worst draft that Tom Telesco's ever done before these guys take a snap, I advise you highly go back and look at the 2014 draft (laughs) and tell me how that panned out. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, it's so tough, too, because, like, we know what some of these people are now, right? Like, we're we're judging draft classes of guys how we know how they panned out versus yeah. guys that we have no idea and versus it's guys who maybe have that. incomplete grades hard. like, you know, Isaiah Spiller and JT Woods. Like, how can you put a grade on those dudes right now with the incredibly yeah. small sample size you've seen from them, right? I mean, it, yeah, to me, like I said, like, it, in the moment, there wasn't a single pick where I was just jumping out of my chair for, right? I mean, I liked pretty much every pick and understood pretty much every pick as it happened. Darius Davis caught me by surprise for sure. Max Duggan felt like it was, like, destined to be. I was, I mean, I was I was bracing myself for that one after the Darius Davis pick. But, I mean, I'm waiting for, yeah. for the TCU mascot to come over to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure there was a couple other guys that slipped away probably right before they could take him. I mean, you're going to take three TCU guys and not get Trey Tomlinson? You're not going to get an actual, you know, family bloodline of your one of your best players ever, you know, arguably your best offensive player of all time. So, like, I mean, at least I, he's still in LA, right? Just with the Rams. I, I, I don't know I, if that makes us feel better or worse <laughs> about it. That's not good. <laughs> he's still wearing blue and yellow. I don't know. Weapon X, TCU West, baby, dominate every game except championship games. Uh, I guess there's a question here for you, Mr. Wade, I believe. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, I have a question most likely will happen. (laughs) Which one of these will most likely happen? Quinton Johnston, seven touchdowns, 800 yards. Or Tui, Tui, has seven sacks, three forced fumbles. Atir is my favorite caller into our show. So (laughs) shout out to Atir. I love you. Um... (laughs) Wow, that's a good question because I think the thing is here is like you talked about how the Chargers went into this draft with like no starting positions that they truly needed to fill, right? Like they had, you know, a, a Louis Gilman who they felt good about at starting at safety. They obviously felt good enough about Kenneth Murray. Like those weren't blatantly open, glaring open spots available, right? And that's weird for Tom Telesco because almost every draft you go into it and you know what position he's going to take more than likely, right? In the Asante Samuel Jr. or Sean Slater year, they needed a corner, they needed a left tackle. Last year, they needed a right guard, right? Like, it's always fell on that way for him. So I was very interested to see kind of where he would go when he didn't have that blatantly open need. But when you don't have those starting jobs available, you look for kind of pseudo starting jobs, right? And if you're talking about pseudo starting jobs, you go to positions where the starters didn't start, you know, eight plus games for you last season. You look at wide receiver with Keenan Allen and Mike Williams absences. And you look at Joey Bosa, right? With 12 games missed last year, like whether or not they went into the season, knowing it, like those ended up being starting jobs for most of the season. So I think out of those numbers, I would have to say Thule because I think, you know, a higher chance of him having to go into a starting role very early on in the season to me, uh, and especially with wide receiver, you know, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams goes down. 
you're going to have Josh Palmer step in, right? Like, and it's still going to be kind of a three headed thing. You would assume even if Quentin Johnston wins the wide receiver camp, wide receiver three camp come job coming out of camp. Right. So I think when the other competition is Chris Rumpf, like I think Chris Rump is probably less competition to Thule than Josh Palmer is to Quentin Johnson. So that's my, you know, weird way of getting to, I guess, Thule in this situation, but both would be insane numbers for either of them to put up. This question is going to go for whoever wants to answer it first. So raise a hand while I ask it again. If you guys are watching, tuning in live, hit the like and subscribe does a bunch to help us out. Is there any enthusiasm asked James Wagner over any of the undrafted free agents? This has been a crazy time these last couple of weeks. So some of us may not have wanted to look and have chosen not to look at UDFAs. <laughs> some of us are insane, ridiculous and have seen some of them. Sure. Uh, who's raising their hand first? that I'm going to talk about UDFA. Okay. Go, so I'll, I'll get to talk about one of them because it's Gerard Clark, the defensive tackle, giant body dude. I mean, just someone you could see, especially with, you know, the injuries to Austin Johnson and obviously Tito Abonia having a mm. better chance, you know, if those dudes can't start the season healthy to have a shot. I disavowed him in my uh, pre-draft process because he wore number 15, I believe is 15 or 16. At defensive tackle and at 340 pounds. So I said, I cannot do it with this guy. I'm taking him off my list. Uh, and I went with this, a different, you know, seventh round. I think I went with Broderick Martin That's or someone. That's a very or Colin Cowherd take there, Wade. You know, he's it's always like they're either wearing like short sleeve polos or the hats turned backwards. He's like, sure. oh, no, he's off my sure. board. <laughs> no, yeah. Number 16 as a defensive tackle. I mean, it's grown on me now because he's on the Chargers and I kind of have to like him to a certain extent. And he's gigantic and I love that for them. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, for him, I did watch a few games of his and like he is a sturdy, you know, kind of immovable object in the middle of your defensive line. And it seems like the Chargers have had times where they don't feel like they have that guy on the roster. Taewon Mullen, if you guys have not gone out and seen him, I think some of us have here. But if you're not, if you haven't and you are live, go check out Taewon Mullen out of Indiana. This kid is awesome. I love what he does. The guy's a technician. Uh, also has like that nasty dog in him too that I think I this Chargers that. team would be all about. Would be great as kind of that slot corner type to fill in. We don't know what's going on with Bryce Callahan. We don't know what's going on with Jazir Taylor, what he's going to look like in year two. Yeah. I think he's got a really good chance. If not your guy, I think Mullen has a good chance of actually making the roster. Yeah, I think two other guys to highlight just uh, looking at the roster and looking at positions of, of need uh, or you know perceived positions of need is I think the tight end Michael Ezeke out of UCLA is one to, to keep an eye on just because I think you look at that tight end room and, and to me it just feels a little bit incomplete and they don't have anybody that you can feel like is going to be a mainstay for years to come. So I think they're still looking at that. And then the guy, a couple of people keep bringing up is A.J. Finley, the, the safety uh, out of Mississippi. I think those are a couple of names just looking at the – the the you know the depth chart at those positions guys would have the have best a, chance right yeah, yeah. A, the most realistic opportunity to to make the fifty three Jake any last names I know there was one receiver that we liked that we talked about in the past Do you want to talk yeah, about yeah no, I mean my highest one of course was Gerard Clark but Wade got a chance to talk about him already um, but yes to your point Dan uh, Pokey Wilson. Again, realistic options. Like, I would love to see this kid make the roster, but that would mean the Chargers would be going seven deep, <laughs> receiver, which obviously or is not he beats out Guyton, which yeah, I I mean, hey, stranger things have happened. You know, we've we've sure. seen stuff like that happen in the past. Um, but the kid looks like a very talented wide receiver coming out of Florida State. I would love to see what the competition is going to look like with him when we get out to training camp. Um, really exciting highlights with that kid. I, I'm interested to see if he can make a climb for the roster. All right, so next question on the topic. We talked about this up at the top. Um, we talked about our favorite. Now let's get into the most important. So Chargers had seven draft picks. I'll start with you, David. What is the most important draft pick that needs to hit in order for this team to be successful in 2023? Yeah, I mean, I came into this 2023 draft for the Chargers uh, kind of knowing that they need to address at least two to three main positions. Wide receiver, edge, and tight end. Okay, they didn't get it. They didn't get a tight end. They did get a wide receiver. I think you know, considering the amount of injuries that the Chargers faced last year with their edge group and the lack of production and the lack of people being able to provide production in you know in Joey Bosa's stead, the most important pick for me was Tuli Tui Pelotu because you just can't 
you know, watch what they did last year and think that it's okay not to add to the edge room. You need to have somebody that can stand up a little bit on the outside that can secure the edge. That's not as much of a liability and run support. And you want a guy that has some pass rush upside and, and Tuli had 13 and a half sacks his last year in college football. So he has a pedigree there and he gets to learn under two of the best pass rushers in the NFL so that he can continue to build out his pass rush repertoire. I got to ask, and I'm, this isn't necessarily a pushback, but this is, might be a counter argument. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people talk about like the idea that, you know, you're in the AFC, specifically AFC West, got to go up against like the juggernauts of the Mahomes and the Burroughs and the Allens and all these guys. And the Chargers offense, I think, has been lacking a bit from an explosion standpoint. And so some would say, and I guess you can kind of use one or the other, but Quinton Johnson, I think, might be the one that is the most important because I think it changes this offense the most in a place where the Chargers, we saw the Super Bowl. Like, the Eagles scored high 30s, low, whatever it was, low 40s. They still lost. Mm-hmm. Like, the Chargers had to score points. And so yeah. I would argue it might be Quentin Johnston just because without him, we know what that offense looks like. And while and- it's dynamic, it's not explosive. It's not game-changing. It's not able to stretch the field like we'd like to see with him. More so than Johnston, I, I think it's Kellen Moore. And, and I've, you know, we've, we've said this throughout Ooh, the entire season. Take a offseason. bow. Take a it's bow, just, David. He wasn't drafted Joe, Joe Lombardi in that offense, you just didn't get enough out of it. And and you know that there's another level that Justin Herbert can get to. And and Kellen Moore ran one of the top offenses in the NFL over the last couple of years. Both, and a very balanced one as well. A very effective rushing attack and a, a passing attack that attacked down the football field. And I think that's what you want. That's what you want to see out of Justin Herbert. So... The most important offseason addition, you know, honestly, both sides of the ball, it's Kellen Moore to me. Jake, draft wise, most important. Is it is it QJ? Is it Thule or is it other? I gotta side with the Thule aspect, man, because as points that have already been made already by the three of you guys, the depth behind edge was horrendous last yeah. year. And yeah. We're all wishing for a very healthy, dynamic duo in Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack this year. But beyond that, you had to find something. Yes, Kyle Van Oy stepped in late in the season, performed admirably. But you expected a little bit more from Chris Rump. Unfortunately, didn't get that. There were some other guys in training camp, Dan, that we saw that thought could bring a little bit to this edge class. But Staley rolled the dice on that. And he only kept three true edges on the roster. Obviously, you were able to... uh, you know, flex Kyle Van Noy between yeah. a linebacker and an edge. So that gave you a little bit of more of a uh, flexibility for a roster standpoint, but you needed some juice behind that. And once Bosa went down, there just was nothing. Khalil Mack was getting double teamed every single week. Triple and teamed. Yeah. yeah. Opposing offenses were just able to impose their will on this defense. So the upfront pass rush Chargers need to get to the quarterback that dictates so much on what impacts the rest of the defense, both at the linebacker spot and the secondary. So to me in year one, I think that this, this is Thule's spot to get. And I hope that it's a learning process too, right? Like you hope that it's brand still kind of learning because when he was asked about the edge rushing position last year, when they just, you know, we're saying, Hey, Kave Noy is a linebacker for us. What did he say? He said, our edge rushers are going to play 85 to 90% of the snaps for us. Yep. Our premium guys are going to play 85, 90% of the snaps for us if they're on the field, right? Until so they I, don't. <laughs> exactly. But I have to come to my boy Dan's defense here. Us Dan's are sticking together on this one. To me, it's Quentin Johnston. And I get what all the arguments are. But like when you look at outside of Kellen Moore, right? What is the other big offensive addition that this team has made? You brought back Trey Pipkins, right? Darius Davis is a huge question mark as far as what he's going to bring offensively because DeAndre Carter... Like that, I don't think that was the plan, right? Like, I don't no. think it was a huge plan for him to, him to be a big part of the offense when Jalen Guyton was healthy, when Keenan Allen was healthy. Like, that's what turned into because of desperation, right? And it, credit to the Chargers from learning from that. And now they go six deep at wide receiver, right? So, like, I think that's a spot. Yeah, bringing where Guyton back to is nice. And like the other big thing going with like the Kellen Moore thing, the thing that made me happiest is. I was able to convince myself they picked this dude because Kellen Moore wanted this dude, Quentin Johnston, in yeah. the first round. He had this choice between the next three receivers after JSN, and this is who he went with. And I'm inclined to, you know, want to let him have whatever he wants. Find the weapon he thinks is going to fit the best, right? If he thinks that's his CD lamb or whatever version of that, go for it. Because if you're going to pick between those three guys, get the guy that's going to fit 
Kellen Moore's offense the best because that's the one you're rolling out this season. And I think it is the best potential upgrade to this Chargers offense. I don't see where it comes from outside of Kellen Moore. If you're just talking personnel, where is the other explosive receiving option for Justin Herbert? We needed that going into this draft. They had to get it. And now that they got the guy, that one has to work out for this offense yeah. for me to go to the next level. Obi-Wan Kavobi. Oh, yeah, we're six deep, baby. Got a lot of comments in here. I honestly can't even keep up. Karina's got a bunch of lightning bolts. Seven, oh, four, no, no. I don't four. know if I want my wife next to the one that says we're six deep. Jorge Rodriguez, <laughs> shout out. Crossover episode. Super excited. Uh, Jacob Great. Sanders comes in. What do you all think happens at wide receiver next season? Do you think Ke- Ke- yeah, Keenan Allen gets extended? Mike Williams gets cut. Jake, we'll go to you on this one. It's a hard pill to swallow, but I think it all but guarantees that at least one of them will not be on the roster next I agree. year. Um, pick your poison on that. I would probably decide that Mike Williams remains. He would be the one that stays. And you kind of go back to Josh Palmer filling in the slot role for Keenan Allen because that looks like that's been the grooming for him this entire time since he's been drafted. And you go back to an offense that reminds you a lot of the Vincent Jackson, Malcolm Floyd days where you have two big body guys on the outside. You have Josh Palmer who can run the slot. And then however else you're going to reload that wide receiver room in the future. But, you know, sad to say it, I love Keenan Allen. Um, but there's the way that everything has gone with all the restructures and him getting up there at age. It just makes the most logical sense that that would be the case. I'm going to disagree with you. I'm going to disagree. Well, does it matter what happens this year too, right? I mean, I feel like that could be part of it too. It's a fair argument. Yeah, I I think it's it's definitely part of it, but I feel like because of Keenan Allen's game style and and the way that he gets open and his savviness and his understanding uh, of what defenses are trying to do to him and the soft spots in the zone, I think his game is more timeless. Uh, I think Mike Mike Williams' game is very exciting, but it's very reckless as well. I mean, he goes up and makes the circus catches. He gets hurt a lot. And, you know, of course, Keenan's had his issues with with injuries as well, but he also had, you know, a four- to five-year stretch where he was very, very healthy healthy and extremely, extremely productive. I think Keenan Allen's going to be that Charlie Joyner type of receiver for the Chargers. I think he is going to be a Charger for his entire career, and that's just my opinion. All right, next question. Kerry Collins comes in. Quite simple. My question is, when will any coach let <laughs> Herbert cook? D. Wayne. Now. Is he cooking the season? Yeah, I hope. I mean, I – it's interesting, right? Because one, what's the biggest thing that's kind of been circulating Charger social media? And it, I mean, to me, it's probably the Keenan Allen going on Emmanuel Acho show, right? Or he sh- who shall not be named, I guess. Maybe that's what we call him on this <laughs> show. Uh, and what he said about him, right? And, and Justin Herbert kind of taking ownership for himself and, and kind of just kind of doing more of whatever Justin Herbert wants to do and kind of taking things into his own hands, right? Like, I think that will probably have to be a part of it too. Like it has to be, it it takes two to tango, right? Like to me, it's Kellen Moore and Justin Herbert finding a way during this short off season to installing a new offense to gain enough trust with each other to where Justin Herbert feels like he can create on his own and cook out of structure, right? But also that Kellen and that Kellen Moore is not going to reprimand him for that, right? Or like that he's going to encourage him to kind of go off on his own sometimes to go a little bit more off script because it's like, I mean, look at the Tennessee Titans game, right? Like when he goes off script at the end of the game, like when he just had to have it and they was just like find a way to get this ball down the field, he rolls out to the right, buys himself time and puts a needle down the sideline 40 yards down the field on the money, yeah. right? Like, yeah. so we know that that works. He has to be encouraged to do that though. Like to me, I think Kellen Moore has yes. to, as a former quarterback, help Justin Herbert want to let Justin Herbert cook, right? Like, I think he has to coax him a little bit out of that show. And I think Kellen Moore having, you know, really brought Dak Prescott to prominence, right? And really had to kind of nurture him and and allow him to go make mistakes, which Dak Prescott made many last year, right? Obviously, Dak Prescott last year was not afraid to make mistakes. He was throwing picks all over the field. Now he has Justin Herbert. Can he coax him a little bit? Can he bring him out of his show and let him know, hey, I'm going to give you the best ways for me, you know, how I think you should be able to succeed. But some of it just has to be you and being the special kind of player that you are. And fight fight against the processor, too, because, you know, we've heard it a bunch of times. Justin Herbert is such a high, you know, fun- functioning processor you know, that, you know, sometimes he sees somebody open and says, oh, I'm just going to take that. That's six to seven yards. We're good there. We're going to keep things moving. You got to try to, you know, say, hey, Justin, take that extra beat. 
take that chance down the football field. You have some of the rarest arm talent in the National Football League. Trust it. You have the ability to make those crazy throws. You just have to have that confidence to just say, hey, I'm going to st- stay in there one more second, and I'm going to let it rip. We're going to go a little rapid fight here. Three questions back to back. I'll ask each of you one of these. All right, here we go. Without further ado, Marcus, Jake, I'll give you this one. Who do you think will fill in at slot corner this season? And I will use a metric. Who will have the most receptions? Third most, I should say, this year. On piggybacking? Oh, on slot corner. Question? Slot corner. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought it was slot wide receiver. Corner. I'm sorry. <laughs> So Just like, kidding, Marcus. Like, Just kidding. We're talking about slot wide receiver. Then we'll go to your question. <laughs> uh, slot corner. I mean, as it stands right now, I mean, I would love to see Bryce Callahan back with this team, but it sounds like as of this very moment, Brandon Staley might have a lot of trust in Jasir Taylor filling that position right now. So it's his job as it stands right now until someone proves otherwise. All right, let's just pretend I could read. So now I'll ask a question that I made up. Jake, who gets the third most receptions as a receiver on this Chargers team? Third most receptions on this team as a charger. Oh. This is a cool, this is a tricky one. There are levels to this. There are levels to this. You know, I would have said in Lombardi's offense last year, even with this Eckler. this personnel group that we had right out, that that was a that was a great answer. Wait, that was actually where my mind was going. It was between Allen and Eckler. But talk about this offense with with Kellen Moore. Obviously, you you would expect the running game to be a lot better. You would expect these downfield throws to come a lot more. Dare I say, dare I say Josh Palmer, dare I say Josh Palmer, third, third, dare I say Josh Palmer. Wow. 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 David, I'll let you rebuttal. Uh, Who's number three at wide receiver in catches. I I can see Josh Palmer being that guy just because, you know, if anybody anybody gets (laughs) hurt, I mean, I I think you automatically go Keenan and Mike being one and two, but I think that's where it really gets interesting with, Quentin Johnston into the mix here. I think we all know what Jalen Guyton's role in, in this offense is. He's going to, you know, stretch the field and and go deep. And I, I feel like his route running has gotten better. But I think I'm going to go with Quentin Johnston. I, I think that you know, the Kellen John, uh, Kellen Moore picked Quentin Johnston or had a hand in picking Quentin Johnston because you know, like Daniel said, he already had a role in mind for what he was going to look like in his offense and how he was going to utilize him. So I think they're going to want to get him involved and get him comfortable and get him going. So I'm going to go with QJ. Rapid Jake, fire, this is, David. This is Rapid right up fire. your alley. This is right up your alley. Jake, true or false? Moore will be Chargers head coach in 2024. What say you? Then somebody better false. tell you got me one word. One word. Somebody better false. tell me whether or not the Chargers are making the playoffs. Which, if they do, which we expect them to do, and they better, then Staley's the head coach next year. Is that the bar? Is that the bar well, right now? Hang on, take it back. They win a playoff game. They there win a playoff it. game. Sorry, let me correct myself. False. <laughs> all right. False. 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 I, I I see this all the time. It pops up in our comments all the time. Will Kellen Moore be the Chargers head coach? Like, I don't understand the process of when that happens. Like, you could probably go back to, like, the 60s AFL and find a coach that took over, right, a head coach's job as an offensive coordinator. But, like, this is not the regular. Like, people are usually package deals, first of all. Like, if a new guy even comes in for Brandon Staley next year, he probably gets his own offensive coordinator, right, if they're that bad. But the thing is, is if Kellen Moore – how is Kellen Moore going to show that he's so good that he should be the Chargers head coach but have the Chargers do bad enough or poorly enough for them to right like to not make the playoffs or something like that. Like if the and, if Kellen Moore comes in and their offense is a juggernaut, like and, and then they're not going to win games. So like I don't know, I I I don't see how that could possibly catch twenty two. Well, and yeah. it's the Tom Telesco of it all too. I mean, if the GM is still here, I mean that's a, a big part of this. I mean, who yeah. knows? Everybody's you you might not not have an, a, a head coach. Or a defensive coordinator off. I mean, you might have to replace the entire staff. So I think there's just a lot that goes into that. Kellen Moore could be a head coach for a team. Sure. Next year. Oh yeah. Sure. The Chargers yes. offense sure. too does well. Definitely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. David, Thomas Costello asked few spots. We needed depth. Are we happy with the tight end room? No. I'm not happy with the tight end room. Uh, I've already said this. I, I feel like, you know, I, I like the potential of the room, but that's all it's, it's really been for me. I mean, Gerald Everett had a, a decent year. I want to see more out of Donna Parham. And unfortunately, Trey McKitty needs to show me some things because last year was a down year for him. So, uh, no, I don't I don't feel good about it. I don't feel like there's uh, enough depth there, and I don't know if there's an, enough 
you know, players that we can say are going to be able to establish that relationship long term with Justin Herbert. I'm higher on I'm higher on Gerald Everett than I think a lot of people are. And I think there's uncapped potential there with him. What I'd like to see That's more. That's the thing with Gerald Everett, though, man. There's always more untapped potential. He's there's always more gotten un- better. Sure, and he has better. incrementally. Incrementally. Yes. I he's like only got I like one Gerald year left Everett on the deal, too. Is the future of tight end on the Chargers roster right now? No. No. See, that's it That's right something there. you felt like you might be able to find in this draft, right? Yeah. Like, not only someone that could, you know, you know, everyone wants to talk about first-year production, you're like, right. for the long game, right? To go to what I was saying earlier, like, you're going to get to a spot next year where you're going to have Trey McKitty going into his final year, right? Gerald Everett's going to be a free agent. Donald Parham's going to, you know, who knows? <laughs> like, truly, yeah. who knows what we're going to see? Like, is Donald Parham going to do enough in this his fourth season to make you forget about all the other three seasons for you to say, hey, this guy is the guy for the long haul? Like, seems unlikely. And I think that's the bummer of this draft. And we're going to get to that, right? Like, what are you feeling? What do you feel like you're missing still after the draft? Tight end was definitely one of the top things on my list because, like, I get it. You couldn't fill every need, right? You couldn't help both sides in the trenches and get, you know, a tight end and a receiver and an edge rusher, right? Yeah. It would have been very unlikely. But I don't think the future is in that room right now. So and it's hard to know kind of what you're gonna get from every guy outside of Gerald Everett in that room. Jake. You can't be happy with it, man. There's just there's so many question marks as it relates to this tight end group. And we knew going into this draft that it was a huge priority for this team to bolster that group with someone with unique dynamic blocking yet receiving talent. And this was the class to do it in. People were saying this was the yeah. deepest tight end class that they had seen in years. Everybody was predicting it. And, it and Tom Telesco said that too. <laughs> exactly. He was yeah. the one position that he actually went in depth in during his press conference was tight mm-hmm. end. And just like the year before, when everybody thought that the Chargers were going to go out and get speed at wide receiver, it didn't happen. So they hoodwinked us again. And, <laughs> you know, who knows how the draft, that draft room was working and, um, what the board was looking like at that point in time sure. as far as what their priorities are, we'll never know. I guess but, they just couldn't find tight ends that were good enough at blocking and receiving. Well, I mean, the other <laughs> thing is is they they yeah, blocking and receiving. I, I ran right <laughs> over that joke. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. David made a good joke. David, you want to do it again? No, no. No, it's too late. Uh, the time already passed. You no, I know. I totally Moving ran on. it over. I, I, I apologize. We're going to let that dead silent in there so we can make David Daniel feel worse. That uncomfortable silence is now (laughs) seeping into Chargers Unleashed. Well, like we know that. I mean, they had a chance to take whatever tight end they wanted, right? Like they could have taken Dalton Kincaid or Michael Mayer. The Bills thought they were going to get him. Right. I know that always is fun to hear when you like the prospect. Like, oh, I could have swore the Chargers were going to take that, dude. And it's like, (laughs) yeah, me too. Don't start with me. Trade up if you wanted them that bad. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. All right, so we're getting into the thick of this, obviously, well into the Chargers Unleashed live crossover with the Locked on Chargers folks. If you're watching live, please hit that like and subscribe. Let us know in the comments what you'd like us to discuss, hot topics you'd like us to bring up. We'll go ahead and try to get as many of them in as we can here towards the end. Uh, Next question on the docket for you, gentlemen. We talk about this year's draft. Let's kind of go back a a second to last year's draft. Which second-year player needs to improve the most or whose improvement is most important to this Chargers team. So in context, like we're talking about like a Zion Johnson, does he need to prove the most? I don't necessarily think so, but there are some second year guys that we have not seen or have not seen enough from Uh, David. Let's start with you. Yeah, this one's easy to me. It's JT Woods. And 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 it's because there's it's kind of similar to the tight end room outside of Derwin James. Who else do you feel good about in that room? I, I just feel like with him, you know what he brings to the table, and you also know what his obvious deficiency is. JT Woods has great range, has phenomenal ball skills, but he can't tackle very well. And and that that's the biggest problem for him. So I feel like JT Woods has the most to prove has the most to gain as well. I mean, if he shows that he can tackle, I feel like the way he can cover on the back end, uh, if if he can you know fix that part of his game, it would be a great pairing with Derwin James. So I feel like if JT Woods comes out here, comes back to play, rededicates himself this offseason, it could be a, a really big year for him. Jake, we have a lot of folks talking Woods here, but we also got another name here. Obi-Wan Kavobi has Isaiah Spiller as the one who needs to show out the most. Jake, which one needs more? You know, normally I would agree with 
with David on this. And I only say preface this because the Chargers totally just passing on getting a DB when we know that Brandon Staley covets his DBs to me just leads me to believe that there has to be a plan to yeah. sign John Johnson. Like there yeah. has to be one. So in that circumstance, just thinking that that's what's going to happen. I'd have to go Isaiah Spiller here for the fact that he was just held out of this offense last year. And the Chargers still, after three years of drafting Joshua Kelly, Isaiah Spiller, and Larry Roundtree, still trying to find that next RB2 behind Austin Eckler, who we think is still going to remain with his team this season and at least play out the end of his contract, even if he's not signed to an extension. We need to see what the Isaiah Spiller project's all about because we didn't get a fair enough chance to see it last year. And I would love to see that in a Kellen Moore-led offense with his priorities and getting this running game back on track. So I definitely say he's going to be a focal part of this offense. Uh, Two-headed monster with Austin Eckler. So I would love to see what he's got. Uh, Dan Wade, I have a question for you. It's a little bit of a curveball here, but... Could it be Jamari Sawyer? And the reason I'm asking, we've seen Jamari Sawyer play tackle in the NFL. We have not seen him play one snap of guard. Do you put him in that category? No, I mean, I think Isaiah Spillware and JT Woods are in a category. And the only dude that might push that category, honestly, is just your Taylor to me. I mean, I think that's the one where it's like right now you're going into this season with, I mean, J.C. Jackson's uncertainty, right? Patellar tendon, like, who knows how that's going to happen or when he's going to be able to come back. You're just trusting that Jasir Taylor is going to be your starting slot. And, like, I loved what I saw from him. I think the dude gave up nine touchdowns his last season in the NCAA, right? And, like, came into the NFL and looked like, you know, one of their most ready rookies to get on the field. So, like, even with that, like, at the end of the season, there were times when teams found where he was at and picked on it. In that playoff games, yeah, teams found where he was at. The Jaguars found where he was at and picked on him at times. So, like, he has to take a huge step if they're just going to give it to him. But, like, it seems like they feel like J.C. Jackson's going to play. Like, it feels it like feel from everything way. we've heard that they think he's going to be out there. And in that case, are you going to Sante Samba Jr. in the slot? But I think with Jamari Sawyer, like, this is the great thing, guys. Like, obviously, for this year, you need him to be a great, you know, starting right guard for you. Like, you need him to be the guy at that position because if not him – then it's Brendan Hymas, you know, who knows. It seems like they've been trying to hide that dude for three seasons. <laughs> if not that, then maybe it's Jordan McFadden who's coming yep. in as a rookie. So I think the Jordan McFadden pick is another reason why you feel better about the guard situation and the backup guard situation. But, like, Dan, I talked about this literally last night. Like, the very worst-case scenario, right, with Jamari Sawyer, if he's terrible at guard, if he's worse than Matt Filer, both of those seem, seem, seem highly unlikely, right? It feels like you're going to get an upgrade almost no matter what at that position with most of that season from Matt Filer. You have, like, an elite swing tackle. Like, you have a, a tackle as your swing tackle, right, which is a, t- a position people want to talk about all the time. They have their swing tackle. It's Jamari Sawyer to me. And when you have oh, that yeah. dude as a sixth-round pick, for three more years on a rookie contract, like there's just literally no way that the Jamari Sawyer pick can go bad at this point. Like you got a guy in the sixth round who's going to give you some kind of value no matter what. And realistically, they might have two swing tackles. We don't know what Jordan McFadden looks like, but like that might be the answer there too. Where I asked at the beginning of the season, I would love to have this offensive line go seven deep. And it seems like right now there's six deep for sure. I should say five deep, six deep, it, hopefully with McFadden. After that, that's where the questions start. And I don't know, but again, it, Rome wasn't built in a day. Got to figure that out. Uh, how, I guess on that note, you mentioned J.C. Jackson. How bullish are we on J.C. Jackson? Do we feel, I mean, all this stuff is looking great. Way ahead of schedule from what I've seen. Yeah. Like, what should fans be expecting? Like, should they s- expect him week 10? Should they expect him training camp? Like, somewhere in between? Like, what do you guys predict? Well, they're saying he's going to be ready for training camp, or they're optimistic that he's going to be ready for training camp. That's basically crazy. what that that's basically crazy. what Tom really? Telesco has seems said. Crazy. I think you def- with an injury of this nature, which is extremely severe, you have to temper your expectations. You got to let him come along. He needs to get his confidence back. He needs to feel like he can go out there and perform without any fear of pain. Because I think that's what it is, overcoming most injuries, right? It's like, when am I going to mentally feel good enough to go out there and just unleash it to be able to just play my game, not have to think about it, you can go out there and play fast? I think you just need to give him some time to show that. I, I think, you know, hopefully he's ready to play, but you just don't know what version of J.C. Jackson you're going to be getting after that very serious injury. Does this team have an athletic trainer? Can we answer that first? 
I'd like Do to they have a new athletic trainer yet because I, I haven't seen that news roll seen across anything. the roll across the scroll. I mean, it's so tough because it's not just about the patellar tendon injury, which you've seen, you know, has really hindered athletes going forward, or at least there are a lot of cases of athletes not being the same dude after an, a really serious injury like the one that J.C. Jackson had, right? And then you also had to couple that damn with the fact that when he was on the field, he wasn't good for the Chargers, right? Like, he got benched for Michael Davis. Like, I was as optimistic as anyone else after watching him and what he did last year at training camp. Yeah. That this dude was going to fit right in. He looked great. He was, you know, telling Justin Herbert that Justin Herbert doesn't want to throw his way at training camp because he was afraid to get picked off, right? Like, that's how good that dude was up until the weird, you know, ankle heel surgery, whatever, and like... Whatever that was. Sure, like a weird, obvious, like, growth of some sort, like just something that could only happen to the Chargers, right? Their CB1 they just paid all this money for is now you know have getting a growth removed that didn't stop him from having 17 interceptions the two seasons prior to that one so like <laughs> that's the hard thing that's coupled with this is not just when he can come back but like can he come back can he start again and can he actually look like the player he was before when he was with bill belichick in new england like that's a yeah. lot of layers to that now we gotta get we got two more topics here one is gonna be more in the positive nature one's going to be more in the negative nature uh jake i will let you decide Positive first or negative? <laughs> Why would you give it to him? You know what he's going to say. <laughs> right. I mean, knowing him, you know, actually, you, know what, of- you know what? I'm going to say this. We'll end it on a very lighthearted note. Okay. So go, go ahead and give me the, the negative one. Smart first. man. All right. So everything's all peaches and cream, all roses. Uh, there are some concerns. We've talked about the tight end position being a level of concern for us. Let's talk about concerns moving forward between now and week one. Dan Wade, start with you. So, I mean, there's different ways you could attack this. If you're talking positionally, for me, it's tight end, and then it's safety, and then it's corner. I I think three positions where you have the biggest question marks that you did not go and address, right? Like, at least at linebacker, you can say, okay, well, let's see what the day on Henley, right? At least with the defensive line, you're like, well, I don't want to stand across from Scott Matlock, so maybe they're okay there, right? But, like, those three positions, to me, are the ones that I'm most concerned about. And, like, you know, maybe once I finally crack into these undrafted free agents, I'll feel a little bit better about it. But at the same time, like, if we're talking about not positionally and not just because of the draft, like, it, maybe it's not – well. Can the defense be good enough to keep up with what Kellen Amore's offense is going to do, right? Can the defense just be good enough to not spoil – what we hope to see and the improvements we hope to see from this Chargers offense. Because I get the Matt Money Smith theory, right? Add as much as you can to your offense and make teams try to play catch up and keep yeah. up with you, right? Because you're going to have to do it anyways. You see the Eagles go and smoke the best defense in the league with the 49ers only to get their second best defense in the league. The Eagles smoked by the Chiefs, right? So I see where the league is going. Can this defense do enough? In these games, stay healthy enough. Can this be the year Brandon Staley's defense? Can it, you know, translate from that four-game winning streak enough to kind of give this team a legitimate chance and not just be a great offense but a great team? David, I'm going to ask you this question before you go to yours. Uh, what is good enough for the defense, statistics-wise? Like, what, where do they need to be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's hopefully just a, a run defense that's a minimum middle of the pack. I, I would <laughs> well, be yeah. happy about I mean, that would be phenomenal. I, I think I'll take that. just the last couple of years, every single team came in saying, I know I can run the football against the Chargers. I am going to impose my will, and there's nothing they can do about it. And when you can run that effectively, your play-action game is so much more effective because – Those boxes are going to be light. Then they're going to be heavy when you get ran all over. Then you're going to get hit over the top with the play action. So I just need to get some better production out of that rush defense. If you got a Joey Bosa and a Khalil Mack that plays 10, 12 games, your run defense is going to be much better just by itself with what he is able with what those guys are able to do against the run. And as pass rushers getting after the quarterback, I just think, man, just give me middle of the pack run defense and I will be a very happy camper. Jake, I know there's a laundry list. Let's hear it. It's a defense for me, Dan. It is, dude. It comes back to it. I understand everything that looks like it's set up right now for the offense very, very well. You can go out and you can execute a nice plan. But it's just every time that the Chargers felt like they did something positive last year, it's just like, okay, let's see if we can hold this lead now. Nope, the team would go right back down and make it look easy and put it up on the board where the Chargers literally had to just get into shootouts, even if they were yeah. even if they were short games that felt like that. Um, but I'm interested to know that Derek Ansley should be rolling 
the clips as Drugmeyer was talking about, I would be roll. I would have a sizzle reel of every 40 yard rip that, that opposing offensive players ran against my defense. And that would be the first thing I'd be playing in training camp because it's a you long know, sizzle reel. It's a you long know, sizzle reel. Sebastian Joseph day and Austin Johnson and all those guys are going to watch that and say, we got to be better at the run defense. And that was one of the biggest hindrances of this team throughout the entirety of the year. Even when the defense looked good, man, I mean, even in their best, even in their best game performance against Miami last year on both sides of the ball, still, it's just you look at the Colts game and even so many damn inconsistencies, even some flashes in the Rams game, inconsistencies on defense. And ultimately, even after a five turnover performance in against Jacksonville in the playoffs, you still couldn't fix it. So. You got to, yeah, you really have to fix that, Dan, in my opinion, because mm-hmm. I know that as, as we talked about, the AFC conference in general is a murderer's row of quarterbacks. You have to figure out a way because you're not going to be able to outscore them all. So, how are you going to figure out a way to stop some of them? Chargers got an international guide today, by the way, guys. Uh, what are your say thoughts? his name, Dan Wilkinson? I can't say, say his name. No, I'm terrible with names. That's why I'm not saying it. Don't put me on the spot. You saw me try to do Tuli. I'm not doing it. Uh, talk to us about him. Do you think he has a chance? I mean, I think if you're going to go to an NFL team, go to the team that has one of the longest storied traditions of keeping undrafted free agents. Go to the team that kept Storm Norton and Donna Parham from the XFL, right? I mean, the craziest thing is, is like now that Gerard Clark's in the room, now you got crazy ass Scott Matlock in the room. Like (laughs) that looks like it's going to be an incredibly heated training camp battle. Not even to talk about Christopher Hinton and, you know, David Moa guys who were getting snaps at the end of the season last year. And not only that, but like the depth that they could get on the practice squad because of whatever the fallout is at that position. That is an incredibly, incredibly thick position or deep position, girthy position, whatever kind of word you want to use for it. But I think girthy is his favorite I, word, by the way. I, I mean, well, that's yeah, on yeah. this show too, huh? That's, that's I mean, in our shows as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a girthy guy. So, like, I, I think if he can find his way onto the practice squad, like, I think that's a huge win. I'll definitely be rooting for him for sure. And it's at least a position group where there's some uncertainty there. Austin yes. Johnson recovering from a major injury. Tito Abonia recovering from a major injury. So you got to look at the opportunity uh, and that, you know, like that, like Dan said about the free agents and, you know, just the amazing storied tradition that we have there, uh, you know, being Chargers fans. He's huge. The Chargers organization. Like the defensive line is a position group where, you know, if you're good enough, you could crack the 53 or, you know, make the fi- uh, the practice squad. So, yeah, there's I'm a chance do, there. I'm going to do my best here. Is it, I'm going to butcher this. Is it, Basil Okoye? I think you're pretty close there. I yeah. feel like the Okoye part, like we've seen enough Okoyes in the yeah. NFL to feel good about that one, right? So yeah. I feel like that's good. I'm going to go with Basile. Basile. Ooh, that sounds better. That sounds better. Okay. I know, you know, there's some French Basile. African names, you know what I mean? That's what I'm going with. Very true. Very true. Uh, Jake, so I guess now, are there any other concerns you have before we get into the, the high? Or I could I could have dropped into specifics, but obviously Wade talked about it with the secondary. I totally feel that you feel a little bit better with the day on the Henley depth at linebacker. But, uh, you know, Kenneth Murray, we know he's not being, uh, you know, his fifth year option is not being picked up. So it's a huge year for him to see how he's going to perform next to Eric Kendricks. But just the defense as a whole, man. That really is one glaring concern when you look at the way that this offense is built. Kellen Moore as the offensive coordinator looks like it's ready to roll. So defense is still the glaring one. I want to ask you guys, before we get into our last topic, final topic about just the overall hype of this season compared to years past, uh, position that you think is the biggest battle in training camp? Because I think receiver is there. I think you got, obviously, inter-defensive line up there. Running back, I think, is still probably going to be there a bit. Biggest position battle. (sighs) Corner, you got like seven of them. Yeah, I think it's defensive line. I think there's a lot of guys that are going to be in that room battling it out for the kind of the back end, you know, the fifth, sixth, seventh guy in that room. I think there there's a lot of, you know, uh, up in the air situation going on there. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for the defensive line. So I think that's going to be a pretty heated battle. Mr. Wade, do you agree? I mean, that's it's really tough, man. I mean, it feels like. This year, it's not like it's hard to say who has starting positions on the line, right? If you're talking about position camp battles and stuff like that, like who's really fighting for a starting spot? Does Deion Henley have a chance, right? Does someone like that, you know, 
it's Good mostly, point. you know, Quentin Johnston, pseudo starting spot. If you're the third wide receiver, you're basically a starter in the NFL, right? So yeah. I think that these are the ones that stand out the most to me. I mean, how quickly can Quentin Johnston win that wide receiver three role? I mean, we had people picking Josh Palmer on this stream to get the third most receptions on this team this year, right? And I mean, Gerald Everett, Austin Eckler, <laughs> you know, like Quentin Johnston, maybe. Way to be subtle. No. <laughs> but... <laughs> But so I, I think that position battle, I mean, it seems more like a formality. I think Quentin Johnson wins it. I mean, you don't think you take a guy there unless you have an immediate role for him. And you also have the, you know, added experience of knowing that Kellen Moore had CeeDee Lamb as a rookie and he went on to put 76 catches up as a rookie, right? So he used him right away, found a way to use him right away. And it will be interesting besides the defensive line, kind of how the bottom of that linebacker room shakes out, right? With Dayon Henley, will they keep all five of those guys, including our boy Bong, Amen, Ogbogwamiga, and also Nick Neiman? Rolls off the tongue. Look at this guy. I mean, You've I say our so boy Bong. Back. <laughs> I mean, you know he has a long name, and we just call him Bong, right, on a Bong. family show. So, yeah. like, to me, at, at the bottom of that, are one of those guys in jeopardy? Because both those guys have a kind of step in special teams. But if it's Nick Neiman versus Amen, I mean, who knows, man? I think there's a lot at the very bottom of this roster that's going to be super, super competitive. And I think... That's what good teams have, right? Yeah. Competition. Jorge asks, who misses Joe Lombardi? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> we got the Brady Bunch in action here. All right. So we're rounding out last topic for today. Uh, before we get into the comments again, rapid fire as we get out of here for folks in the comments who are tuning in live. Give us your questions, topics. We'll try to go rapid, rapid, rapid fire at the end. Uh, last topic for today that we have scheduled. Gentlemen. We were on the show last year, and everyone was talking about how hyped we were for this team. Oh, man. And then, you know, a whole lot of injuries and a whole lot of things went wrong. I think it's I got like trashed a- for going saying 12-5 and five last year, and I was like a, a martyr, I like, guess, as far as like, and no one like, what? You think they're only going to go 12-5 and five next year? I, so like, I'm record, afraid for this. I went 10-7, and seven, by the way. I predicted 10-7. and seven. Hell, did not think it was going to go that way, but sure. I said 10-7. and seven. It's a few of this uh, route to get there. Sure. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. What is the hype level for this season? Are we all jaded or are we actually hyped? And how does it compare to years past? I think the chargers are flying under the radar and I'm happy about it. Okay. Okay. I'm happy about it. I'm (laughs) tired of the chargers. Somebody has to hold the positivity. It's a sexy pick. I'm tired of it. Okay. And yes, I'm super optimistic all the time. Okay. Sure. No, I I am a little jaded about the injuries. I'm in a, you need to show me mode. Okay. So I'm happy that they're not the sexy pick. I'm I'm happy that they're flying under the radar a little bit. Show me what you can do. I know the talent is there. Go do it. It's, I mean, say that last line again for me, Drugmeyer. <laughs> I know the talent is there, but you got to show me. Go do it. It right. sounds like, you know, Los Angeles Chargers. I know the talent's there. <laughs> now show me. You can, it sounds like the title of a on documentary. Paper. On paper. Yeah, on paper. Yeah, on yeah, paper. Right. Something like that. Something that we've been saying for the last, you know, better part of a decade. Yeah, I've removed that, that from my brain in, 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 in regards to the Chargers, so it's no more on paper. <laughs> it's show me on the field. <laughs> right. That's it. I, you know, Dan, it's... I almost feel like you asking this question is a little bit of the kiss of death, and I hate this. It's like when you ask me, it's like, hey, you know, bold predictions, Jake. What's the score going to be type of thing? I hate this type of question because right now – Right, get yes, it's but point. you have a chance right. to say how terrible you think they're going to do. This is like your soapbox moment. But it's tough. Literally, the draft was last week, so of yeah. course, all of our emotions are way high right now. We haven't even seen these guys take a snap yet. But I mean, it, and it's and it's hard even now to not escape the on paper, yeah, you know, agenda here. Mm-hmm. But if we were to say that. If, if health is on their side, and for what we believe that Kellen Moore is going to do to this offense, because it was a severe hindrance to this <laughs> team the last two years, you have to feel somewhat optimistic for it. So, and again, we're talking about a tough AFC West conference. We can't say it's going to be just a cakewalk and the Chargers are going to be able to score all these points against everybody. So I'll tell you what, Dan, I'll, even, I'll go one game better than I had predicted last year. <sighs> And I'll even give you a damn prediction what? for it. I'll, yeah. Wow. How about Who that? Who is this guy? All of a sudden, he's that? optimistic. This is I, weird. I, hey, we're, we're in May, bro. The draft just ended. You talk to me in three weeks from now, <laughs> this could be a whole different trip. Are we more hyped this year at this time than we were last year? Absolutely no. not. No. Absolutely not. I, last no. year was the, the height of hype. 
Yeah. yeah, right. I mean, it was the, the money pre- was being spent. Tom Telesco oh, yeah. had lost his mind. We're signing all these guys left Eight and right. Draft picks, the most cap space in the NFL. They won the offseason last year. And I think that's where I would somewhat agree with David on this as far as flying under the radar is like that was the maximum hype they could get. Right. And I think the lack of hype this year is because we're seeing almost the same squad with very very key differences right like Kellen yeah. Moore is a huge addition in my opinion right I, I you know Quentin Johnson could be really really big for this team but like for the most part they're running it back right they're restructuring they're yep. keeping the core guys together and they're running it back so last year they were the hype team I think there's less hype going into this year but there's zero doubt in my mind that the Chargers should absolutely be a better football team than they were last year and that banged up team went 10 and 7 so yep I'm hype. <laughs> and what? You, you always know how hyped you are when you end it with a question. I'm Ron Burke. <laughs> yeah. There it is, yeah. Execution was beautiful there, Dan. i got to give I'm you credit hyped. for that one. Take it back. The one, the one thing that I will say about this year versus last year is we said it for a while. I think the issue with this Chargers team, and it's been this way probably for the last five, ten years, has been it's not about the top end guys. It's always the underbelly of this roster where if slash when those top end guys miss time, can the underbelly take over for them and it not be such a steep drop off? And unfortunately, the answer last year was no. This year, this whole entire draft looked like it was targeted for the underbelly of this team. That was yeah. not the case sure. last year or years past or last year in free agency. All the guys yeah. we got were starting guys. Uh, Jamari yeah. Sawyer, just here, Taylor would probably beg to differ though. But that I'm talking. I'm talking. J.C. Jackson was brought in. Bryce sure, Callahan sure, was sure, brought sure, in. Sure, Kyle Van sure. is brought in. All these guys yeah, are brought in to fill a starting role. Right now, what starting role is there to fill other than John right. Johnson possibly coming to this team? Yeah. So On that's paper, what gives the optimism. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, well, <laughs> someone, hey, someone in the comments, shout out to one of your, you know, one of our listeners, one of our viewers who said, "How many Super Bowls have the Chargers won on paper?" And my answer to that would be, "They're the New England Patriots of on paper Super Bowls <laughs> of the decade <laughs> dynasty, if you will." Thanos, baby, we got all of the Infinity oh, Stones there, man. Oh man! All right, guys, this has been super fun, gentlemen. Thank you so much for doing this. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, before we get out of here, tell us about what you guys are working on. How has your draft coverage been? Are you able to relax now? What's new for you guys coming up? Well, I mean, thank God the draft coverage is over. We will be talking about undrafted free agents late, but better late than never. But hey, man, we have we have a lot of stuff. <laughs> We're every day, you know, wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube, and you know, this is the time where we start really having to get into the nitty gritty of what we are going to talk about. And I think that's when a lot of the weirdness comes out and sometimes leads to the best shows for us. So a lot to get into for sure. And a really, really exciting season, right? I think, you know, besides Jake, we're all pretty hyped about the chargers right now. So I, I, you know, a lot to be excited about indulge in as much chargers content as you possibly can just truly throw yourself into it. There's so much good content out there. So many good content creators in this community, and I'm just, you know, really proud of you guys and, and like how much you guys have grown during the process of when we knew you. David, I mean, sure? Dan Wilkinson was watching me run 40 yard dashes at SoFi <laughs> Stadium only a couple of seasons ago. Like, I pulled my see... hammy doing that. <laughs> oh, yeah, we all did. We all did that day. You know, I, I ran like a 5 2 flat. It was fine, but that's not the point. The point is, I'm really proud of you guys. I appreciate you having us on the show. And I mean, not. I think there's going to be lots and lots of content for you guys to all dive into during this offseason. It's, it's a very exciting time, I, I think, to be a Chargers fan. Dan Wade's running the girthy 5240. David, what's up with you? <laughs> Yeah, That's well, important. hey, I mean, just like just like Dan said, man, we're we're every single day, Monday through Friday. So you know, we're going to be cranking out the off season content. We're going to be looking at position groups. We're going to be looking at hopefully a John Johnson signing. I mean, we're going to be covering everything. So rookie minicamp, you name it, whatever happens with the Chargers, it will be talked about on the Lockdown Chargers. Podcast. How much lighter do you feel, dude? Now that you're that clean shaven <laughs> face, and that beard's gone. In- Bro, it's so funny because every single time I shave my face, there's at least two to three comments that say, <laughs> "Who is one, this where the hell is the beard at? <laughs> right. And who is this guy? Did you get a new host? I'm like, and also Man. that you've lost weight, though. You get yeah, that which, comment a lot now. That's a good one to get. Which is awesome. But yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm here to tell you that I haven't lost I'll just say, is it true? Don't <laughs> tell anyone that. At all. Don't tell okay. anyone that. I appreciate it. It's wonderful. But I have not lost any weight. 
Well, Not you look be- you look beautiful. Uh, or hey, Rodriguez, in the comments. I don't know how locked on post episodes every day. You guys get real creative. If you guys do not follow and subscribe to the Locked On Chargers, they have so many fun topics, so many interesting discussions. They do fan questions as well. They do mailbags. I think every week, guys. Yeah. Um, it's hard to do five shows a week and have new fresh content, and these guys do it in spades. They've been covering the charge what for eight eight seasons now. Eight seasons now. Yeah, we're about to go into our eighth. Yeah, Holy long time. Most yeah. people just, just aren't built that way. Most people you guys never are legally married. Then, uh, <laughs> yes, but yeah, by those standards, yeah. Well, I was saying, Jake. I mean, Jake knows me from way back. Back when oh, I yes, was doing sir. pregame shows on on uh, a couple of other shows. Man, that was ten years ago. So, I mean, we've been in this content creating game for the Chargers for a very long time. We all stuck through it and stuck through way worse seasons than you new Chargers oh, fans yes. have had to deal with. Right? Where were Seriously. you for four and twelve? <laughs> Thank Where were you, you for five and eleven? <laughs> what does Philip Rivers do with that beat up roster last year? I saw some four and twelve and five and eleven seasons, right? I love Phil. Never mind. I take it back. <laughs> <laughs> you favorite. can find you can find the guys over at Locked On Chargers on podcast on YouTube. Please go check them out. Help them support them. You can find David at Dro Talk SD. You can find Daniel Wade, the girthy Daniel Wade, at Dan Talks Sports. You can find Jake, his forward hat, optimism and pessimism, but more optimism <laughs> on this episode than I've ever heard before. I mean, at, don't get used to it. I know. <laughs> we bring We're it in, out of him. It's only That's May, it. dude. <laughs> it's only May, dude. It's find only him May, at Jake D. Hefner. Guys, gals, thank you so much for tuning in to Chargers Unleashed Live. This has been a ton of fun. Can't wait to do it next. We'll talk to you next time on Chargers Unleashed. Bye.